Um, welcome, everybody. Hey, hey, there's Lou. We're getting flashes of faces as people join. So welcome. My name is Michael Gibner, and I am proud to be the president of ACG New Jersey. And um, we have both members and non-members on board today. So for those that aren't members, ACG Association for Corporate Growth is a 50-year-old global organization. We have 60 chapters uh, around the world, 14,000 members. And, um, you know, really, we are all about middle market growth and driving middle market growth. So from deal makers and business leaders to various types of professionals, that's what ACG is all about. And a lot of you know that. And we get together monthly in person, which we haven't been able to do. And we're now seven weeks into this new normal, whatever that means, ever-changing scene. And it's really our approach with this event and going forward is really trying to highlight the positive things that are going on, the innovative leadership that we're going to need from each other, supporting one another, from taking the cue from various leaders, the entrepreneurs that are really helping mold what's gonna be our new normal. And there's no experts out there. We're all in uncharted territory. There's no question it's scary times, but at the risk of sounding corny, I'll say for the last 250 years, our country has proven to be resilient and filled with perseverance. We're gonna get there. And in a second, we're going to get to a guy who's a leader and an entrepreneur who's been navigating his company for the last eight years. Phenomenal growth story. Um, and I think we'll all be able to take a tidbit away from it that we could probably apply to our own practice or, you know, take a positive piece and say, all right, now how can I apply that to my business? I think it's going to be enjoyable, informative. And I'm excited. It's good to see everybody. And um, forgive us in advance for any tech glitches because it's a work in progress. And there's going to be more from ACG, both global and New Jersey, more events, more value add, because we need to hear from the folks that are part of this chapter to help continue drive business because we're not going anywhere and we'll get through it. So um, I want to take a moment. First, just to thank um, our chair, our chapter executives, Diane McLevy and Joanne Maud, two phenomenal women that are really helping this go and, and, and taking the reins from behind the scenes. So thank you to them. Our sponsors, which really, truthfully, we wanna, we wanna help our sponsors. They're good to us. We wanna be good to them. Um, our Diamond Innovative sponsor is Eisner Amper. Platinum Innovative Sponsor is ADP. Our Platinum Sponsors include Cone Resnick, CSG Law, Gibbons Law, Giordano Helleran, and uh, Cisla. Gray Sky Films, real quick on Gray Sky, video production company, they're gonna be putting together a 60 to 75 second highlight clip of this interview with Brian. You'll see that in the coming days. So thank you to Gray Sky for that. Another platinum sponsors include uh, m and Bank, NJ Advanced Media, Wells Fargo, and Witham. Gold sponsors are Mazars, Sterling Bank. And our media sponsors, News 12 New Jersey, NJ Advanced Media, NJ Biz, New Jersey Law Journal, The Alternative Press, and ROI NJ. Thank you, Tom B., who we're gonna hear from as well, who's gonna be interviewing Brian. So thank you to our sponsors. Um, a couple of housekeeping things real quick before that we, uh, we turn it over to Tom and Brian. Um, everybody is muted. Please keep it that way. Uh, we're, we welcome questions. Put the questions in the chat at the end of the interview. Tom will get to some questions from the audience. Um, so please do stay muted. Uh, video, turn the camera off say hi but then you can keep it off and um we're gonna let tom and brian do their thing again 
you put the questions in the chat. We'll get to them at the end. And, um, you know, looking forward to this interview. So without further ado, we're going to turn it over in a second. I will say Tom Bergeron of ROI NJ, he's the type of innovative leader and entrepreneur. Guys like that, you know, real quick on Tom, he, he and his partner, they took over ROI, I guess, less than a year ago, or maybe a few months ago officially. And that is all about business in New Jersey. So thank you to, RO, uh, to Tom and his team at ROI NJ for providing great content for all the readers throughout New Jersey and for, for doing this interview today with Brian. And um, our, our man of the hour, so to speak, Brian Berger, of, uh, found, he's founder and CEO of Mack Weldon. And many of you know, I mean, Mack Weldon is really one of the premier brands in the premium basic wear, menswear apparel. And I got to tell you guys something. Brian and I are friends from the time we were kids. So we go way back. We were in high school together. And as you can see, I'm a, I'm a pretty, I'm a big guy. I wasn't this big in high school. I did put on a few. But Brian, back in high school, he used to make comments to me like, give, these boxers are so uncomfortable. What is this Hanes company? What is Hanes doing? You know, these undershirts, they get all bunched up. I, I swear to you, th these are factual tidbits that he said to me when we were 16. And I'd say, Bri, I know, what are we gonna do though? These things, it's uncomfortable. You fast forward 30 years, okay? And he actually took that, what, what he perceived as a defect, a flaw, in the undergarment, underwear, and t-shirt, under, undershirt world, and started a company just to fix that flaw. So I share that with you because for me, to have heard him complain about his teenagers and now see him do what he's doing, it's amazing. So on that note, Tom, take it away, and uh, let's hear from Brian. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining us, guys. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Appreciate the, uh, the kind words and the introduction. And, and I got to tell everybody, I'm going to need to take a break here for one second. I'm going to have to call my mother. I've reached a career high. I'm now doing an internet program where men are talking about their underwear. So this is there really, you, you know, top of, the, top of the mountain, Tom. Yeah, I don't know how we could ever possibly top that. Um, this is it. it it's, it's uh, you know, I was going to make the joke. It was a good thing to see Gibner wearing the coat. Um, you know, Brian and I are just in shirts. And, and earlier today on GMA, if you didn't see it, there was, in fact, a man being interviewed in his underwear. So that apparently is the topic of the day. Um, so, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it over to Brian, the founder and CEO of Mack Weldon. He's going to give us a view from 10,000 feet of a little bit about what the company does, how it started, where it got to where it is. And then he and I will chat for a little bit, try to bring out some uh, some of the things that he has learned that, that you guys can learn, and we'll take some questions and go from there. So with that, Brian, I turn it over to you. Let's, uh, let's get the overview going. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Michael, for the, for the warm introduction and kind words. Um, the last time Michael and I shared a stage like this was when we both uh, lost in the ninth grade student council elections, having... <laughs> having served uncontested for the prior three years in middle school. Uh, it was a kind of a rough entry to high school, but we persevered. Um, Michael was the all-time scoring champion in our basketball, high school basketball history. Uh, if you could believe that, I was not. Uh, that's why I'm, you know, making underwear, I guess. Um, so uh, just a little bit of context, um, you know, Michael's, uh, Michael's story about, you know, me kind of wonking out about products, you know, back in the day, I was always the kind of person who got really excited about brands. Um, and those could be consumer product brands, it could be a service brand, it could be something in the food and beverage category. But I really just always had a real passion and enthusiasm for uh, brands that solve problems for consumers and really did a great job defining themselves through products and services um, and really delivering a consistent sort of high quality um, experience um, at scale. And um, my professional life was really very different. I mean, I worked in the consumer tech uh, and digital media businesses, um, you know, early day, you know, Internet 1.0, Excite, Excite at Home was one of the major kind of Internet portals. Um, I was a very early employee there. I worked for um, WebMD, which 
uh, was a company that had ups and downs, but you know, we, we took that business and grew it to a multi hundred million dollar, you know, public company and amazing publisher of, of health related content. Um, and then I did some corporate strategy and investing for a large media company uh, that you may know called Comcast. And we were acquiring and investing in um, consumer internet and digital media properties. And I spent a lot of time looking at e-commerce companies and learning a lot that helped inform sort of how we set Mac Weldon up. But, but really the, the, the birth of this company was that of, as Michael said, you know, the plight of a frustrated consumer. I hated shopping for underwear and socks. It never made sense to me. The advertising didn't make sense. I hated going to department stores. It felt like it was choice overload. The product was always very inconsistent. Anytime I found something I liked, I could never find it again. Um, and so one day I came home, my wife had thrown out everything in my drawer. And so that forced me to that final pilgrimage. I think it was to Bloomingdale's and I was standing there like, you know, about to have a panic attack. And the sales guy came up to me and said, are you confused yet? And it was at that moment where I knew that I had to sort of take matters into my own hands. And so I started to spend a lot of time kind of on the side, talking to guys and, 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 and keep in mind, like, we were looking to solve a problem through a, a range of product, but, but really the ultimate vision was to build a brand, a brand that was really known for some very specific things. And so the sort of mandate or, or sort of the vision was reinventing men's basics. Um, and to, to us, that meant three very specific things. First, uh, product that was unique and differentiated that you know, we can really own and point to specific innovations we were making at the product level. Uh, two, um, you know, being uh, digitally native. Um, and that's not just that we're largely e-commerce driven. It has to do with how we think about and utilize data to drive pretty much every aspect of our business uh, and the proximity we have to that data to make decisions. It's not that larger, more kind of incumbent brands don't have that. It's just our ability, um, you know, our proximity to that information and the ability to incorporate it into decisions in real time is just much closer. And then the last piece is this um, notion of being direct consumer. Uh, many of the incumbent brands, at least in the kind of top drawer basics category, uh, socks, underwear, undershirts, and tees, most of the products and brands in those categories rely upon third parties to sell their goods. And to me, that just felt like a huge missed opportunity because these are products where there's a gigantic amount of loyalty that's up for grabs. So if you could deliver a better product, a better customer experience, uh, then you have a shot at creating real long-term uh, loyalty and hopefully license to do more as a brand. So over the course of the last seven years, we've um, not only made a significant impact in our core products, core replenishment basics like socks, underwear, undershirts, and tees, but we also um, have diversified into other categories very successfully like sweats and loungewear and some kind of performance apparel uh, polos and, and, and things of that nature. But everything we do follows a very specific formula. We need to be able to make some sort of a notable upgrade to the product. There needs to be some sort of design or fabric innovation story that we're telling. The sizing needs to be pretty straightforward. We stay away from fashion categories. We only focus on kind of evergreen products, which makes our inventory profile very attractive. Um, and we generally avoid heavy duty seasonality although we do have some products that are a little bit seasonal in nature. Um, so I'll pause there, let Tom do his thing. That's good background. I wanna bring something up. We talk about premium pricing, which is a nice way of saying, you know, this isn't three packs for $5. Um, talk a little bit about the pricing of the brand and what you have, and then we're gonna get into the pros and cons of that during, during this type of time period. Yeah, I mean, the price point is um, mass premium. So. And by mass, I mean, you know, there's a multi-billion dollar market in our price points. So, you know, that feels mass, um, you know, versus like a luxury good, you know, more of a niche category. Um, generally, what you would see in a specialty store or a department store, um, you know, uh, again, I'm just speaking specifically about underwear, uh, price ranges from 24 to 32 bucks, um, socks, you know, you know, 15 to 20 bucks. But, but more importantly, as it relates to price, our perspective was we want to deliver really good price value. Um, and that if we can do that, customers will care less about price and care more about, you know, um, 
you know, uh, the brand equity that we're building with them. And so from the very beginning, we noticed that this was a category where incumbent brands were very promotional and, and, and the sort of customer mindset was really oriented really heavily around price. You know, Father's Day sale, 20% off here, 50% off there, you know, all of this promotional marketing. And we didn't want to deal with any of that because we feel like it's a brand destroyer and it creates customer behavior that is really artificial. And so we, when we launched, we made a very explicit decision to never have sales, but to always reward customers for engaging more deeply with us. And so we have a volume-based pricing model um, where customers can save, um, and now they're able to create um, more than just savings by virtue of, of, of how deeply they're engaging with us and how loyal they are to the brand. All right. So let's talk about customer loyalty. I, I think when we come out on the other side of this, everything's going to be different in the relationship with customers and their brands. We can, we can talk a little bit about retail versus e-commerce, but I want to go to a greater extent and talk about how your company, you're trying to meet each individual directly. And I think that's a lesson that anyone out there can understand and relate to. Talk about the ways that you're, you're going to do that to build that one-on-one -on -one relationship, even as a national brand. Yeah, I mean, some of the things that we, well, the, the, there's, you know, kind of normal, normal state. Um, you know, we have a loyalty program that addresses uh, various tiers of customers. We try and keep it really simple. Um, but the idea there is um, loyalty, in our view, is created through people, customers being able to experience uh, a wider array of products from us because basically you could think we make the best underwear in the world. And so you're thinking about us in a very through a very narrow lane. But if we uh, are able to deliver on that value proposition in underwear, sweats, polos, uh, and socks, then we've just made a much broader impression on you. So our loyalty program is really oriented to try and uh, motivate customers to try more. Um, and so there's various ways in which we do that. Other things that we do in a time like now where we're all dealing with a lot of unprecedented um, uh, situations is we really just try and make sure that our marketing, the frequency of it, the messaging in it, uh, all very much speaks to where the customers are at right now. And so rather than sort of heavy handed chest thumping, you know, about how awesome we are and how great our product is, it's a much more kind of um, you know, uh, just a much more kind of toned down voice. We're really trying to only really market and merchandise products that are relevant, right? Um, we, we even delayed a really important product launch because we just felt like, you know, this product isn't something that consumers are wearing right now. And so let's not, let's not, you know, be tone deaf and start marketing to them a product that they're really only going to care about when they're going back to the office. Those kinds of things, I think each, you know, uh, in aggregate, um, I think create a level of, of, of loyalty and customer engagement that you know, traditional brands just don't have the ability to do because they're not, they're not able to have that conversation directly. All right, so let's talk about this scenario. The good news is, if there is good news about the fact that everybody's at home, everybody's online right now. We're in a digital world and you are a digital product, right? You are not a brick and mortar, you're a digital product. It's great, you're meeting people where they are. The bad news is, is that everybody's online and everybody's trying to get to the digital marketplace. So it's being flooded and, and people are, are approaching this in different ways than they ever had before. I think there's probably some opportunities for you to pick up more customers. But at the same time, the market share and the market situation has just got to be in flux. Talk about how, are there any changes in your strategies now as opposed to what they would have been two months ago, knowing that there's so many more people available and so many more people chasing that customer right now? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, one advantage that we have and, and companies like us have is that we are, you know, the muscle that we have most developed is digital marketing and customer acquisition, right? That's what we do. That's how we drive sales. That's how we drive our business. And so um, I would say that we, we and companies like us were poised to capitalize on anything positive going on in the places where we all look to for kind of new customer prospecting. And, and largely that's two places, Google and Facebook. Um, you know, industry pundits call them the duopoly. Um, and no matter what you do and what other channels you market in, these are the ones that generally have the ability to drive transformational growth in your business if you can kind of hit the right lane. And, 
And, and you know, those marketplaces over the course of the last 12 to 18 months have been really, really, really challenging. It's been very hard to make it make the economics work. And what happened when COVID-19 hit was so much demand exited those marketplaces. And they are marketplaces. They're exchanges, like a trading desk. So imagine a trading desk, you know, where just a, a gigantic percentage of demand just disappears. So if you're a company that is um, poised to understand that and you have a product that um, is for the moment uh, in demand, then you have a real opportunity to step on the gas. And so, you know, I think there's um, a certain product categories and it's not just, you know, consumer apparel, there are a handful, but there are a lot of other product categories, obviously, where, um, you know, there has been enormous demand. They take take uh, meal delivery. That's a business model that's been really challenged for years, you know, and, and was exposed when, when um, Blue Apron went public. Um, you know, those companies are, are kicking ass right now because they're able to acquire new customers at a very, very, very inexpensive rate and, and make the economics work. And so, you know, for businesses like us, it's, it's been good, um, but very much, you know, taking it week to week because a lot can change. So let's, let's stick on the idea of the, the challenges slash opportunities that are taking place right now. Um, you and I were talking a little bit yesterday about how different companies can, can take what the marketplace is showing now, perhaps market their product differently or do different ways to it, um, that can show that, hey, we're relevant, we're thinking, we're being creative, we're, we're meeting people in a different way than we ever did before. G give the people out there some advice for how, you know, different ways different companies can, can, can take this as an opportunity more than a challenge right now. Yeah, well, we, when we were talking yesterday, I mean, uh, we, we, um, we live uh, in New York City, and, and one of the things that's been so impressive is seeing how, you know, some of the local businesses have, you know, try to adapt to what's going on right now. Um, so, for example, there's a, a burger uh, shop, uh, like bar burger place, like right near our apartment. And, you know, they make most of their money, you know, off of uh, like, you know, packed bar and, you know, high velocity, um, you know, kind of fast casual food. Um, and they have pivoted in a really unique way. On the one hand, they are selling, kind of wholesaling to direct consumer uh, the raw materials to make their product, you know, much in the way Shake Shack is doing, where you can like order the components of a Shake Shack burger to your house. These guys are selling pre-made burgers, they're seasoned, they're ready to go, uh, fries, all those kinds of, all the things that they would typically serve in their restaurant. You can just go up or you can order it and pick it up right off the sidewalk. But they've also confer converted their, 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 um, sidewalk facing um, uh, storefront into like a little mini mart. They have condiments, they have chips, they have some basic items that you might want, snacks um, and cocktails, because it's weird in New York, I guess you can deliver cocktails now that there's this quarantine going on. So, so that was just like a really, one example of a really innovative um, way to, um, you know, keep a connection to your customers broaden your kind of customer equity, uh, both in terms of like providing a service, but also just kind of getting credit for being smart, I think. Um, you know, and then there's others I mentioned, I think what, what Shake Shack is doing is kind of super interesting. Um, certainly from a marketing perspective, it's really interesting. Um, you know, all the major steakhouses in New York are like selling their steaks. You know, they have fridges full of dry aged steaks. And so you can go to Peter Luger's and, you know, uh, you know, some of the top steakhouses and get steaks to go, um, treat yourself, you know, while you're, while you're locked in your house. So, so those are all examples, I think, of, of, of companies being really innovative and thoughtful. You know, here at ROI, when we, when we talk to businesses, everybody, one of the things that we hear over and over again is how this is forcing people to um, more quickly adapt digital ideas that they had that they were thinking about doing. Everybody knew that they had to get a better work from home program and this and that. And, and we're certainly gonna see that speed up. But I, I use that just as a segue to, to something again that Brian and I were talking about yesterday and how this is an opportunity for companies that when they've had ideas in the back of their mind or even in the front of their mind and on the sideline, 
this is an era right now in business and marketing where everybody gets a couple of mulligans. You get free ideas. You can try anything right now and say, oh, well, you know, it's COVID. We got to do this. And, and, and there's no fear of, boy, we made a misstep and this is going to hold us back. People are willing to accept different things. And, and talk a little bit that, about that, Brian, how this is just a, a free time where you can, you can try five different ideas and maybe one sticks. And it's just a chance that um, it, it's open season for ideas, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, we uh, we talked about pricing earlier. You know, we've never had a like a sale. Uh, we've never sent an email out about a sale. But um, you know, when this first started and we weren't sure what the impact was going to be to our business, we very much um, were envisioning how we might execute kind of a one-time, you know, um, opportunity to drive to drive sales. Uh, quite honestly, we didn't know whether or not we were going to be down by 50, 60, 80%. So um, everything was on the table. And, you know, so that's, that's an example. Um, you know, I think it's a good time to test um, on the, on the digital product and, and website side of the business. There's a lot of testing that goes on to ensure um, that you're being as efficient as you can be um, with your e-commerce uh, piece of your business. And so, um, it's a good time to get some of that done, especially if traffic is down, um, you know, and so, so those are examples. I think um, customers definitely have, uh, you know, to your point, I think a mulligan is the right, right way to put it. Like if something doesn't go right uh, or it's something that's not core to your brand um, and you're nervous about it and how customers will, it will, whether or not it will change their perception, I think this is a time where, you know, you, you kind of can get a pass for that kind of stuff. Uh, and a reminder of the folks out there, we'll get to a QA and a from you guys soon. If you have some stuff, you can start throwing it in the chat there and, and people will put, be putting those together. Um, I can talk all day and I don't think anybody's going to vote for that. So um, get the <laughs> ready early and often and we'll go from there. But a few more for you, Brian, here. Um, you know, this is great. We have a nice upbeat conversation and, and we're talking about how you can try different marketing techniques and you can do things digitally that you haven't done before and you can reach a new brand of customers. The reality is when we come out of this, there's going to be some companies that don't come out of this. This is going to be the demise of some people that, that might have been a little too precarious in their business plan or over leveraged. Talk a little bit about companies that, that you're saying, MT, if you're doing these type of business models, it's going to be tougher for you to come. And, and here's a way you can save yourself and things that companies really need to think about to be ready for, for right now and in the immediate future. Well, I think marshalling resources, regardless, is important, right? Because, you know, things can be good today and really bad tomorrow. So I think it's just an opportunity to think long and hard about, you know, the investments that you're making and, and sort of how critical they are and whether or not there are things that you can or should consider, you know, putting off until things are a bit more predictable. On the other hand, you know, um, we had a lot of strategic initiatives that this is actually a really good time to get a lot of this stuff done. And, and even though it does require investment, we believe that it will set us up uh, to really accelerate once things come back to normal. So we wanted to, so we made that calculation. Um, and so I think just, but just being extra, extra thoughtful, um, about, you know, kind of resource and, and, and resource allocation, um, is really important. And, and just, again, just making sure that you're holding, um, all of your initiatives, um, to, you know, you're able to measure the impact of things as clearly as possible, because clear, you don't want to be in a situation where you're, you know, you're spending, you know, um, you know, precious resources on initiatives that are not, you know, producing a return, you know, and look, there are some companies that just don't, 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 don't really have a choice, right? I mean, you know, if you operate a boutique fitness uh, studio right now, I mean, you're, you're, you're at zero. I mean, your retail business is at zero. Actually, another good example of, of a, of a pivot, um, our, uh, one of our investors owns uh, Barry's Bootcamp, extraordinarily successful, 50 or so um, units, you know, high flying, top of the top of that uh, food chain, you know, their their doors are shut right now. And, and so they had to very quickly pivot to a model where they're able to offer, you know, kind of home uh, studio classes. It's not there. They're not Peloton. They're not set up for that. 
but in relatively short order, they're out there with classes and a business model around it. Um, so, you know, I think you, you got to pick your spots. That's, that's something that required investment and risk. But clearly, I think they made that calculation that it was not only an opportunity to help them weather the storm, but also diversify their business model. Smart move. Um, I would say others, you know, may not have a choice just because, you know, if you have one unit, small retail store, um, you know, you may not have a choice in terms of how you, you know, how you get the wheel turning again, until things open back up. All right. So your, your smarts and passion for business and marketing and entrepreneurship are coming through here. Um, starting to see some questions popping in here and somebody asks, okay, you, you got to believe in yourself and clearly you do in your product and what you're doing. They're saying, can you give one example where you had an idea where people were saying this, this isn't going to work. And you said, trust me, it will. And you, and you push through some of the naysayers, whether it's immediate people in your company or the general public. And you said, I can, I just believe that this is going to work. Can you give any example of, of where your vision and then your determination pulled you to the finish line? Oh yeah. The whole thing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I talked to, you know, so many, especially in the consumer space, you know, you're sitting around, hey, I got this great idea. You're at a cocktail party. People are like, yeah, that'd be cool. Like, or then you have the naysayers like, are oh, there's 50 other companies that do that? And like, really? You think you're going to get people excited about underwear and socks? Like, guys don't care about that stuff. Um, so I, I would just say with any, any entrepreneurial venture, and many of the people on this phone, phone can relate, it's just a matter of pushing the rock up the hill and being the one to continue to sort of create momentum. Um, obviously, you know, success is really how you define it you know, we were looking and are still looking to build a global consumer brand that is, you know, delivering very, very unique customer value proposition and growth and all that stuff. And so we're not nearly where we need to be, but, um, you know, so, but, but where we are, we are a success relative to, you know, kind of what that initial entrepreneurial vision was. And, you know, many people at that point in time would have said, you're crazy to do this. Why would you leave like a comfy corporate job where you're making good money and have lots of upward mobility and secure salary and all the stuff and go do something super high risk like this? You know, the key is to just, you know, if you have the, you have the vision, you have the passion and you have the ability to kind of keep it moving forward, then you give yourself an opportunity to have a shot at creating some level of success. All right, so let's keep it on the on the digital mode here. And someone's asking a question on the benefits and the risks, the pros and cons of they're calling it podcast advertising. I would think it's digital promotional advertising. A little bit, quite frankly, what we're doing here is is do you see any way that you can market yourself through this type of webinar podcasting? You know, aside from getting Larry King to be your co-host, what what would be the the road for that? Uh, well, podcast advertising does really well for us, and there's a, a bunch of reasons why that is. Um, I mean, that is, um, in my view, um, the best form of influencer marketing, because you're essentially paying um, a, a personality who has a loyal and engaged audience to endorse your product in their voice, which is pretty unique. Um, you know, if you look at kind of traditional radio, um, it's very rare that you get that. I mean, Howard Stern's obviously the master of that. Um, and, and, and there are some others who, who do it well, but largely speaking, what you get on the radio is a programmed, even if the personality is reading it, it's a programmed read where they're reading off of a script. And so the reason why podcast advertising works so well is because it really feels like it's in the native voice of the personality. And it also, um, generally, if you're if you're tuning into somebody's podcast, there's a lot of connection there as a, as an audience. So you will, you are more susceptible to influence from that, you know, from that personality. And so it's worked out really well for us. Things like this are great. I mean, any opportunity we have to speak really has a twofold benefit. One, generally a good audience for us to position the brand to. I mean, I don't know how many dudes are on this call, but or people who make decisions about shopping for, for guys. I mean, it looks like pretty much everybody. Um, so there's always that, but, but more importantly, it's really about thought leadership and, you know, being able to be out there and, and sort of not only telling our story, but also getting really good questions from people who uh, either have perspective that we don't, or just make us think about something that we're not ne necessarily thinking about yet. What a nice segue to very good questions. I've got another one here. 
what do you perceive as the most valuable when making marketing decision? Uh, a specific follow-up, how important is customer acquisition cost versus general brand, brand awareness cost? Uh, all of our marketing uh, is um, is looked at on a ROI cost of acquisition basis. And so even channels like podcasting and radio, we try and track it back to a, um, a you know, an ROI. Uh, obviously, the digital channels, it's easier to do that because you have a direct link between, you know, a person clicking and whether or not they convert. Um, and, but, but we do so much of that type of advertising that there is, uh, and, and we are building a brand, so we care very much about um, how our brand manifests itself in our direct response oriented marketing. Um, because, you know, um, there's so much of it out there that it does also serve as kind of brand advertising, you know, how people perceive the brand. Someone's asking about experiential programming that you can do. How would that um, work with your brand? Um, I'm not totally sure. Like maybe if there's an example of what you mean by experiential. Um, you know, we've done events. Um, you know, we've done customer events. We've done partnerships and activations and things of that nature. They're good. You know, I think they serve a different purpose. They're less about you know, driving revenue, direct revenue, but they are important for the brand. They're important for kind of customer relationships. They're important for creating co organic content that we can promote that ultimately rolls ladders up to brand um, through social media and other channels like that. All right, talk about the idea, and this is a good question. Um, you, can't, you can't interact with media today in any way, shape or form without being a call to action for charity, for giving, for foundation. How do you balance that need for a company that appears to be giving back and doing well? And not appears to be, you seem like a decent guy who wants to be, right? All companies are gonna have to balance this. Are we chasing dollars? Are we chasing the good of society? How are you as a company, you know, helping others who are, who are gonna be less fortunate coming out of this? This is gonna be an interesting balancing act that I think a lot of companies are gonna have to to, to, to deal with in the coming weeks and months and years? Yeah, I mean, I think it all comes down to authenticity. I think customers will read through it if it feels like you were just pandering uh, to the moment or uh, adopting some type of business practice for the benefit of being able to capture um, some mind share in a kind of CSR marketing lane. I think whatever it is has to feel authentic um, so, you know, if you look at Warby Parker, for example, I mean, the, or, you know, one for one was a model that existed long before that company did, but there was such a really clear connection to their, um, you know, incorporating that into their value proposition, given the founders and where they came from and the fact that they had spent so much time um, in the nonprofit world, focusing on delivering high quality um, eyewear to developing countries. And so, so it was very authentic. Um, in our case, there really wasn't something that was super obvious out of the gate. So we said, you know what, let's build a business first. Um, and then let's figure out the right way to have an impact. And there's a variety of ways in which we've chosen to do that, both at the kind of ongoing corporate marketing level, but then also um, situationally, like what's going on right now with the COVID situation. We're responding to a specific moment. All right, next question. Um, specific thoughts on IP tracking and remarketing to anonymous website visitors via email, direct mail, social media. Uh, give us some thoughts on that. Um, I think, you know, it's, um, it's always a little weird as a consumer when you visit a site and something shows up in the mail or you're being retargeted in ads. Um, but it's pretty pervasive um, marketing strategy today. And I would say from my standpoint, I've discovered more that way. Um, but I can understand why consumers find it to be really invasive and annoying and obtrusive. And my, my sense is that over time, there will be more, the, the, the regulations will be more and more supportive of companies not doing that. Uh, but obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's the most 
high yield type of marketing that we can do. If you come to our site, you browse a bunch of pages, but you don't shop, you don't convert, our ability to show you an ad in your Instagram feed or somewhere else out in the world is, you know, is it's just a very, very, very high uh, conversion potential ad. So, you know, we're operating within the rules, but I can understand why as a consumer, it would be frustrating. So let's talk about um, the consumer experience and as more and more goes online, do you think that coming out of this, the difficulties that your traditional brick and mortar retailers are going to have, is this the end of them? How do you see this shaking out? How are they going to have to, to transform themselves to be ready for the next era of buying um, when we're, it's going to be a long time before people are even comfortable walking into a store? I think it will be the end for some, um, some who are highly overextended and very sick going into this. I think it will be very hard um, to reverse that with this compounding all of the issues that existed beforehand. I think for others um, who were maybe a little sick, uh, but not, not headed into to, 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 to the ICU, I think it's an interesting opportunity to reset you know, if you have the opportunity to, if you, if you have a hundred store retail footprint and that's, you know, you know, that is really holding you down and causing you, your business model, a lot of challenges, you know, and you have the opportunity to get out of 30, 50% of those leases uh, or renegotiate or just scale back. Um, I think that you'll see a lot of companies do that effectively. I think if you're a big global brand that is reliant on department stores to distribute your product and, you know, retailers that are um, not doing right by you. Um, you know, you might be able to rethink that strategy and take it, take a more direct approach. Um, you know, it might mean taking a step back, you know, before going forward, but I do think, you know, this is an opportunity to, to sort of rethink some of that and, and, and the situation certainly gives you cover to do that. You know, when I, when I talk to people in the retail brokerage industry, they, they say sort of the same thing that you said. There's a lot of people that were riding this wave for 10 years or so that were totally over leveraged, didn't see this coming. Now the, 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 the paycheck, the rent is due, so to speak, and they're really going to be in trouble. Um, you, you have built your company the right way, the, the smart way. Talk to, to an entrepreneur out there or a young company about business practices that you put into place, even when times were great, right? I mean, the, the economy couldn't have been better the last 10 years, but I'm thinking you still did things the right way that have prepared yourself that for now, if there is a turn, you're still in position. Talk about just some of the basic ideas of building your business and doing it the right way that people just getting started need to understand this is how you get from A to Z. I mean, there are so many things in that. It's a great question. There are so many things in that, but I'll just, I'll just give you one sort of example or, or thing that we think about a lot. And, and some of my experience um, on the other side really kind of, you know, exposed me to this. So, so a lot of it comes down to like how and who you, you take capital from or how you capitalize your business. Um, and making sure that those investors, uh, their expectations around growth are aligned with what yours are. And that even though as entrepreneurs, we're always high, trying to achieve, you know, the, the, the highest valuation for our business, that making sure that that's calibrated as well. Because I think when you, um, when that gets out of sync, it forces decisions that create stress points that are that are really, really magnified by a situation like this. And so I don't know that, I, I would say that's, there's a lot of hindsight in that. Um, I mean, I knew going into this that certain types of investors behave certain way, but I would say, you know, um, you know, given that we're, we are where we are seven, eight years into this, I have the ability to look back or at least look around at some of our peers and say, yeah, if you have, if you're a company that's, you know, 50 to, five, 50 to 75 million in revenue and you've got 350 employees and you're spending, you know, you're way over your head and, and marketing spend for new customers and losing money and, you know, all that, like that's, that's not, our, you know, that, that recipe only works when times are good, right? When you can go out and continue to raise capital at higher valuations to fuel the machine. If the music stops, you know, then it gets really hard really fast. 
and I think the music has stopped. Um, someone asking about Zoom calls, online learning, working remotely, doing this type of thing and how that's gonna impact you know, business going forward when you have your team and you're trying to, to coach them and work with them and bring them to the next level when you're doing more and more things remotely. Should businesses be ready that, that this is the way they have to reset their models? I talked to, a, to an office broker today and he said, I think businesses are gonna need to understand for social distancing that you're gonna have employees that come in on Monday and Wednesday and other employees that come in on Tuesday and Thursday. We may never have the full group together in the office again, just for social distancing rules. How do you see that as far as building a team, uh, making that work going forward? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I share quite that extreme of a view. I think for the foreseeable future, it's going to be, you know, phased and iterative. And it might be a minute or two before everyone's, you know, shoulder to shoulder at their desks again. Um, and it, we have like an open floor plan kind of workspace. So, um, you know, people are relatively close to one another. Um, but I, I think that video conferencing and, 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 Zoom or Google Hangouts or what have you. I mean, those are the real winners here. I mean, seeing how everyone has been able to operate um, so productively in this mode, both from schools to, you know, corporations to doctors, healthcare professionals. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, and so I don't think it'll go all the way there where like you just have this kind of remote, you know, more people working remote than in an office. But I do think it will significantly impact how we think about building our teams and how much we travel for work and, and things of that nature. All right, so <clears throat> we've been looking forward. Here's somebody that's uh, a little bit looking back, but uh, a combination of, of worlds. Talking about, do you ever foresee the opportunity that you would open up a brick and mortar shop of your own or be in other brick and mortar stores? You know, it's a nice specialty uh, at a high-end mall. This seems like this would be a nice fit. Um, for your products to come in. It, can you see any value to be to having even just a few brick and mortar locations? Absolutely. We're, um, we actually have one store. Um, we were huh? part of the original um, uh, group of uh, emerging brands that was chosen to be a part of the Hudson Yards project. So we are, um, okay. we are on the second floor of the shops at Hudson Yards. That has been a really, really fantastic uh, experience for us thus far and we you know we look forward to continuing it um, and we do have a plan uh, to uh, expand in a limited way our physical retail footprint obviously this situation will you know it, it, it won't give us pause in that we won't you know we don't know we no longer believe in it but it will give us pause in that we think there will be some really interesting opportunities that come out of this and so our goal is to put ourselves in a situation where we can be able to react to opportunities. Um, it's not about having lots and lots of stores for us, but it is about having some more customer touch points in many of our key markets where our customers are. I would think just the marketing of that alone to have people yeah. buy and see your brand associated with other ones would give you, would make it worth just having a front. Yeah. Assuming the rent, yeah. okay. Yeah, I mean, we're holding all of our, you know, Hudson Yards, we hold accountable to, you know, its own, you know, uh, its own economics. But from a marketing perspective, it's, you know, it's, it really is extraordinarily valuable. Somebody asking about Hudson Yards and the tourist trade that comes here. Do you, do you see a, a global impact when people, when you get people from all over coming into New York, maybe coming by there, um, you're introducing your brand to, to, to a global audience that you wouldn't normally have seen there? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, well, I think part of what we loved about Hudson Yards is that, yeah, you get, you get actual tourists, you get local tourists, people from the suburbs coming in and out, and then you have a whole community of people, business guys who are there every day, um, you know, uh, and then uh, residential community there. Um, so we love that. Um, absolutely think that, you know, tourism to places like New York is going to be severely impacted by this, at least in the near kind of medium term. Uh, how that will manifest itself, um, you know, is sort of TBD. Um, you know, we have a really good partnership with Related, and I think we feel confident that, you know, that will, you know, all sort of navigate this together. But, um, but certainly, you know, it's something that's on our minds. All right, I got one more question before I kick it back to Gibner, who I think has the update on the eighth grade vice president uh, election results. <laughs> but, 
Um, ninth, it was ninth grade. Was ninth grade. Say, yeah. <laughs> seeing, um, seeing your career as you spelled it out at the beginning and talking about how you took these, these different steps that, that are all related but weren't related. You were willing to gamble and go into different areas and change different jobs and become an entrepreneur. I'm going to say that you're always thinking a few steps, a few weeks, a few years ahead. When you look to the future right now and you think about where this company or, or what you'd like to be doing five years from now, I, I want to say, what, what does that look like in your mind and how is that vision different than it might have been two months ago? Uh, that is a good question. I mean, I think for us, um, you know, the story doesn't change all that much other than the fact that we always viewed e-commerce as the center of the wheel for us. Um, but building a global multi-channel, um, you know, men's lifestyle brand was really the vision. And so I think that still very much, much holds. And if anything, you know, the online e-commerce component just is that much more fortified by the fact that, you know, everyone is only shopping this way now, right? So like, even if you were a person who were not, you were not super comfortable giving your credit card, not being able to try something on, dealing with the returns, you know, you're having to do it now. Uh, you've been forced to do it. So I think as a result of that, you will see a lot more consumers, particularly in like baby boomer, plus um, really coming into the market opportunity that didn't previously exist. And so we're excited about that. And we are excited about the fact that we can be opportunistic about how we think about offline retail, whether that's direct retail in our own stores or partnerships or third party retail. I, I do think that the department store landscape is going to change significantly. And that's, and that's a question, right? Because whether we like it or not, they're a high volume player. So without them in the mix, what does that look like? If you want to get your products in front of a large, you know, a large audience of offline customers, where do you do it? And so uh, I think that's an open question now. All right, I'm going to do one more because one of our viewers is a better interviewer than I am. I should have thought of this question at the beginning because I think it's a good one. Um, how has the current pandemic changed your supply chain and your view on supply chain on what you're getting products from and is any of that changing? Well, we always, always made sure because we focus, uh, it, it's a little bit of a challenge for us because, because we're so product focused that once we kind of go down deep into a path with a particular supplier, it's hard to just say, oh, well, let's, let's build up a parallel supply chain somewhere else because so much goes into getting that, that, that manufacturer or that mill up to where we need them to be. That said, we have over the course of time, always tried to create a level of redundancy in our supply chain for our major product lines to ensure that when and if something happens, we can pivot. It's not perfect, um, but um, even in this scenario, we haven't had to affect any of that, but we certainly were um, relying upon those plans to do that if major parts of our supply chain went down. Awesome. All right, 356. I'm going to kick it back to Gibner. Uh, this was great. I appreciate your thoughts. I, I think it was pretty insightful for everyone out there. Um, so I thank you. And Michael, take it away. Thanks, Tom. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. And, and Brian, thank you very much for joining us. And if I, if I could, you made one point where you said, the, the, cust the, the, the retail brand that has 100 locations and now they get their chance at a reset. And I think all of us, when we do a self-analysis of our business and our practices, it is an opportunity to, to do a reset and understand that in the coming months, we, we all need to improve our efficiencies and companies are gonna go through some pains. And um, I really think this was very insightful and excellent to hear from you. So thank you to Brian and Tom and our friends at RYNJ. Thank you for, for conducting this. It's really great. And uh, be on the lookout from uh, the ROI folks with a follow-up and um, our friends at Great Sky Films with a, with a highlight video. And just in general, with, there's more to come from ACG New Jersey. So stay with us. We're going to stick together and we're going to figure out the best way to help one another get through this, hearing from leaders like Brian Berger of Mac Weldon 
and uh, stay safe, everybody. It's good to see familiar faces, and we'll talk again soon. Thanks so much for having me. Take care, guys. All right. Take care, Take care everybody. Right. Be Thanks, safe. Everyone.